Welcome back to episode 12 of Spider-Man Dissemble. Let's jump right back into it. Norman figures out that Spidey's camera tracks a sensor that's on Spidey's costume, and I immediately wondered, is this true? Didn't Peter have to get a new camera just three stories ago? And hasn't he been having all these money troubles? Would he really have been able to jury-rig this, especially with us not seeing it? Of course, it turns out later in the story that this is true. You find out it is absolutely true that he does have a sensor in his Spidey suit that the camera tracks, and I'm like, I would buy that if it weren't for the fact that three stories ago his camera got trashed completely and totally trashed except for the memory stick and he had to get a new camera and he had to like spend his last bit of money on that and like everything that he got from peter parker paparazzi went to paying off harry and that story was written by dan slot i'm not entirely sure about the camera thing either with using the spider tracer for it i i thought it was just like motion activated but i i could be wrong that does seem odd maybe he changed it sometime it seems weird that slot would have mentioned it before and messed up here but ugh. so it doesn't seem to work for me. Uh, I find that really forced and not workable. Unless there's something I'm missing here. Also, Norman doesn't even consider that Peter is Spidey here. Is this because of whatever Peter did, or is Norman just carrying the idiot ball here? Because it seems like finding Peter Parker's camera webbed up and taking photos of Spider-Man, and then immediately thinking, oh, Peter never took the photos to begin with, he's just a cover, ha 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 ha, rather than saying, I wonder if they could be the same person. Seems stupid to me. It seems like Norman is a friggin' idiot, especially considering deep down inside one assumes he still knows. Or even lacking that with Norman, you know, he, I, I still go back to what I said at the beginning of the story arc where Norman believes regardless of what that connection is, there is some type of connection between Peter Parker and Spider-Man, and even if that connection is just Peter is a dupe and a cover for Spidey, he would be dragging Peter in and breaking his knee caps until Peter would tell him how to, you know, get a hold of Spider-Man, how he could trap him, how, you know, basically use that in some manner. And the fact that he's not even doing that with this is also just very frustrating. So the sweatshop gang was being used by Oscorp for medical testing. But for what? We get to see the guinea pig freak all spread ribbed at Oscorp, which is pretty yucky. I didn't need to see that. You know, I'm just glad that there seems to be an actual purpose behind Freak, because I just remember, I'm like, man, this is just kind of such a useless throwaway character. I can only assume that because of the brain trust, you know, this was totally something that they had planned with him from day one, which makes me happy because he wasn't a complete waste. Also, it kind of makes me happy because it means the people that the brain trust were just totally sadistic because they're like, you know what? At some point, we're just going to be Viva section in this druggie. Oh, and I don't know. For some reason, them cackling like madmen thinking about this just gives me the warm fuzzies. And then we get Norman's great kick the dog moment, which is awesome because, you know, if anybody doesn't need a kick the dog moment, we have Norman kicking the dog by being like, and guess what? You will never get high again. It's like, no! Like, seriously, he's even kicking a druggie when the guy's down. That's just... Man, that's sad. Again, heavily implying that Harry is menaced through a scene where we find out that someone's taken stuff from a goblin cache, but we knew that already, so that seems unnecessary at this point. Harry seems confused about it, but he could be lying. Peter gets shot with bullets and lots of glass shards. Is this going to be another shaving accident? So one of the big things that happens here is the coffee bean is pretty much destroyed. We find out that the Spidey Tracer thing in his suit is real because he does this thing where he plants the tracker on Bullseye. It's a nice little plan, if a bit obvious, but seriously, when did he do this? Mac Gargan is now Veno Scorpio Maximenus, or whatever. I guess we're supposed to care. Yeah, it's kind of weird how, like, the penultimate issue of New Ways to Die, not a lot of things really happen in it. I mean, so far, issue three has really felt like the high point to me. I mean, that big battle between the Thunderbolts and Spider-Man and what I was saying before, that really, I believe, a lot more tense and interesting fight and dialogue between Norman and Menace has just been far, far more interesting. So it's like our whole stakes at the end of part five is just really, you know, we've cured Gargan of the Anti-Venom and we now have him in his old costume too because he needs to be in it because he's weak right now. 
and Norman's back in the Green Goblin outfit, which, you know, I mean, that's not really a thing to me, I guess. I just don't really see that as being a huge deal here in Spider-Man, where when that happened over in the Thunderbolts, when he finally starts to snap and ends up, you know, bit by bit going into his Goblin persona, there's a lot more meaning to it then than it is here. Here, it's just assumed at some point in time, he's going to end up getting into the goblin outfit. So it's like, eh. This story is so much about, oh no, it's Green Goblin, now stakes are super high. But since we have no clue about how Spidey's forgetting spell works, it's just vaguely threatening at best. Again, numerous references here, and in Thunderbolts, to Gwen, which, again, I just keep asking, does Norman wonder, why did I rape and kill that teenage girl? I mean... Thoughts like that would plague normal people, I would think. I know Norman's not exactly normal, but come on. Norman heavily implies that Harry came back from the dead because of the goblin serum. Plausible? I so don't remember Harry's death. Could that have happened? Like, is it believable in the sense that Revelations was believable when Norman came back? As in, no, it's ridiculously stupid, but if you, like, shut one eye, squint the other, stand 7,000 miles away, you could maybe make it work. Is it that plausible enough? To answer Michael's question, at least my answer to Michael's question, Harry coming back from the dead due to the goblin formula is entirely dependent upon Norman coming back from the dead because of the goblin formula. So because of how ridiculous it is that Norman came back, it's equally ridiculous that Harry came back because of it. Now, it's been a long, long time since I've read Spectacular Spider-Man 200, so I am not 100% sure, you know, just taking that into context by itself, how easily it would be for Harry to come back, but I mean, it was... I believe that the intent was very much that Harry was dead. I mean, because he was gone for a large number of years, so... So I have to say, I've already mentioned that I hate John Romita Jr.'s new artwork style, but Part 6's Spidey Anti-Venom Spider- splash page I think is awesome. Wow, I, I love how Spidey's like just kind of treating anti-venom like his stupid kid brother, you know, he's like, during that splash page, which I agree is actually really pretty awesome, you know, Eddie, you're doing it again. Sorry, your power is cut out and you could fall to your death, and we don't want that, do we? No. I mean, it's just really, wow, man, he just totally crushed him at some point in time, and I totally missed how that happened. It's kind of like a conflicted, yet loyal dog. I have to reiterate that I feel this Norman is different from both the Thunderbolts Norman and the I'm gonna kidnap Spidey to make him my own son Norman, both of which are post-resurrection Norman. So reading through this, there's something I'm, I'm thinking of that they just haven't really dealt with when it comes to the Venom symbiont, and that is, wow, it really is a hyper-crazy, jilted lover, I guess, because when when Brock had it, I, I swear there's a point in time when he got really, really close to killing Peter, and the symbiont starts to pull off from him. No, I actually, I remember now, that's one of the ways that, I'm, uh, that Peter actually def- defeats Venom, is he's just about to die, and then Peter strips off his Spidey costume, and he's like, I welcome you back, symbiont, and you know, the symbiont, like, starts slithering off from Brock and going to Peter, and and of course, that's just a lure to get it into, like, a ring of Sonic or fire or something, I don't remember exactly what it was, but it's like, obviously, the symbiont is still in love with Peter, and now, not exactly the same thing, but something similar happens between Brock and, uh, Gargan, where he's about to defeat Brock, and the symbiont's like, no, Mies loves Brock, it's like, really? Wow, I really wonder what relationship relationships are like on the Symbian's home planet. Uh, really, it... Okay, maybe I don't. Spidey going absolutely batshit on Norman is really nice. He's like grabbing onto his head and slamming him through wall after wall, and Norman's like, my skull is crushing, and Spidey's like, who cares, you're gonna come back anyway, why should I hold back? And it's like, it really feels nice and climactic. But from there, it suddenly turns from, I'll kill you, Norman, to jokey and goofy, and it doesn't work. Like, really, it turns, and it does not work at all. Also, having Spidey mock the names and ideas that Slot's writing feels a little silly and a little cheap, I guess. Like, that's a cheap way to make a joke if you're just making fun of the stuff that you've done. Apparently, Harry was behind some human experiments known as Prometheus. The hell? That doesn't seem Harry style. And, okay, so either Lily is menace or she knows something because Peter almost finds a weapons cache and she flips, kissing him. Seems kind of out of the blue here. 
I thought the fact that the weapons cache, you access it by pulling on a book that says The Rise of the Norman Empire w was cute. It's, it totally fits. We see that Mr. Lee is getting sick and there are no more miracle cures at Feast, which does once again imply that somehow the cures were happening because of some sort of symbiotic thing that he had with Brock, or something else happened, who knows. Spidey seems to be healing pretty fast from the bullet wounds and glass shards. Michael, it's not bullet wounds and glass shards. He nicked himself shaving. I mean, how long does it take for you to heal a nick from shaving? I mean, come on. Don't you push your weak genetic code on Peter freaking fast healing Parker. Thank you very much. And the end reminds us that anti-venom is out there somewhere. That ending, I just had the old Incredible Hulk music from the 80s TV series just playing in my head as Brock walks off, lonely and sad. But he should take heart, because someplace out there a symbiont loves him. A lot happens here. It's a big climactic battle in a lot of ways, and in many ways this feels like kind of the wrap-up to part one, or like book one of Brand New Day. I mean, this feels like a lot of the plates that we set in motion have now come crashing down, and we are at a different place than we were, what was it, nine months ago or so when we started Brand New Day. So I thought that there's, you know, a lot of fun stuff that happens during this six-parter, and I mean, it's definitely not my least favorite story arc that's gone on in the Brand New Day stuff, but it, it didn't feel as big to me as it really should have, I guess. You know, like the return of Goblin just, I don't know, it just really didn't have much oomph to it. I think the story almost works. Almost. I feel like the fact that Norman is defanged, I, I, I think the fact that Norman is different than he is over in Thunderbolts is not that big of an issue. Really just not that big of a deal. It could be one of those things where like, you could write it off saying, well, it's like any fear. It gets to you and gets to you and gets to you, but once you confront it, you're able to overtake it, and that's what happens with Norman here. Most of the stuff that I was interested in were things that, well, didn't deal with Spider-Man for the most part, you know, it was it was the stuff that went on with Menace and Norman, as I've mentioned, you know, way past the point that I should before. The changes of the subplots that's going on with Harry, you know, that type of thing, which is good. I mean, that's what supporting cast is there for. You're allowed to have a little bit more wiggle room of life-changing events you can have in a supporting cast than you usually do in the main character. So, you know, that's fine. But but really, there's just no personal gravitas to this situation with, between Peter and Norman, which, which is sad. The big, big, big problem is the fact that Norman just isn't scary to me. Spidey, I think, should have no problem handling him, and he really doesn't because it's Spider-Man. And Norman's now just some guy who has a lot of power but doesn't know who he is. That just defangs him completely for my money. So the entire like ratchet up, ratchet up, ratchet up, ratchet up, tension, 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 tension of this story is like, eh. He'll get out of it in the end. You know, you had that moment where, like Michael said earlier, where, where Peter snaps and just starts putting him through walls and stuff, but it just, it's not the only reason that has any type of emotional impact on the reader is for the stuff that has gone on between Peter and Norman way prior to this story arc. And if you're not familiar with that, then there's just nothing that happens during this arc why you would care about that. If you're a reader with Brand New Day and just starting from there, and only tangentially familiar with the history between Goblin and Spider-Man, there's just nothing in this arc that really makes you go like, holy crap, yeah, Spidey snapped on him and friggin' Goblin deserves that. You're just kind of like, eh, you know, mm -hmm. Norman's kind of a jerk because, you know, he made it so a drug he can't get high anymore. You know, it, it's it's more a story about Harry's world crumbling down than Spidey's. I mean, hell, Spidey doesn't even seem affected by all the bullet wounds, yet Harry's life is completely and totally changed and screwed over. Be really curious to see where Harry goes from here. And Lily, I guess. Yeah, Lily. But like I said, that being said, it's it wasn't horrible. I mean, you know, I, I think it was a pretty well-crafted, put-together slot. I think it's definitely really finding his feet on writing the book. I usually feel that big story arc, like multiple issue story arcs, could be slimmed down into smaller chunks, you know, and like it didn't necessarily need to be six issues. But that being said, there there is not a lot of wasted space in that, you know. I mean, there, there's definitely stuff that could have been cut down. But overall, at least... At least in my mind, there wasn't huge, ugly gaps of just filler that was going on. And those that were aren't by slot. You know, it's the backups by Wade that really is that kind of just empty air there. I gotta say, this is the first storyline where I've thought, you know what I think would really make this storyline better? And what would 
make the tension far more interesting and ratchet things up in a better way and make me care more, MJ. Having MJ in this storyline would have made me care like 10 times more. I think she would have fit so well in this storyline. It would have been interesting to see Peter going back to her, him getting scared that she might be in danger, the stakes being raised on that end, Norman taunting him about girlfriends he's killed in the past, etc., etc. But we lose all of that. We lose all of that completely. I will agree with Michael that, that this would have been a great place to have MJ, but, you know, I'm kind of biased because I kind of tend to think that about most stuff. But, it, you know, yeah, it totally would have been nice to see MJ involved in this, you know, because we already had a hint that, that whatever it is that caused people to forget that Peter Parker is Spider-Man, Peter knows about that, you know, and had some hand in it, even if we don't know what the exact mechanic behind it was. It would have been nice to see maybe Peter even just be paranoid about, you know, Goblin remembering, suddenly remembering who he is and suddenly, you know, going after him or MJ or his loved ones. That would have been something I would have liked to see there during the story arc, as opposed to just, you know, Peter being pretty much rock solid sure that Norman wouldn't remember. It just seems like that really would be a fear that Peter could have, is that just suddenly, for some reason, Norman, of all people, will suddenly remember that Peter Parker is Spider-Man and just come gunning for him and... You know, that didn't happen, but, you know, so... And I think this is why it was a really good idea for them to keep using new villains for so long, is that when you bring back the old villains, all of a sudden the fact that we've lost all of this history, it just doesn't work. Because, like, Norman can bring up Gwen, but he has no real reason to bring him up around Spider-Man. I mean, he, he killed her in front of him, but he's killed plenty of people, I think, kind of. And Spider-Man hasn't been able to save them, so Gwen has no importance anymore. Except in a weird way. I mean, obviously Goblin's kind of fixated on her, but as I say, it doesn't even really make any sense as to why he killed her or why he still cares. Because he doesn't know that it means that much to Spider-Man. Because he doesn't know that Spider-Man is Peter. So, to recap my feelings on it... I enjoyed it, like I said, well enough. I totally don't think that this was necessarily the bestest way ever to have ended the, the first act, I guess, maybe, or, you know, whatever, the first big important chunk of Brand New Day. But it totally was not the worst. It was solid. It was nothing spectacular, but but it was it was definitely, you know, a nice, solid storyline. It had a lot of good beats that I liked with it. There were some good action sequences. You know, I mean, they, they avoided most of Peter Parker's personal life, which is kind of a good thing, since they just, you know, don't know what to do with any of it. And pretty much all of the focusing on the supporting cast members were the cast members they actually like, which means Harry and a little bit with Betty, you know, so there's that. So that that's good. This storyline made me miss MJ, like, in a real solid way. This storyline was also a lot of decently interesting stuff. A lot of things happened, and you feel like it has weight, it has momentum. But like I said, all in all, you know, I, I think it was decent. I, I enjoyed it, totally enjoyed it, even if I totally didn't love it. Really curious to see where it goes from here on out. I hope that they're able to continue this kind of ability to keep all of these plates spinning. It kind of feels like maybe the wrong way to go now would be more stories like the crazy snow demon one. As much fun as I had with that, this feels like, okay, now the stakes are raised, now we have to kind of focus more on the plot for a while. So here's hoping that they don't go to spin-offs and everything. I actually have not read anything beyond this point at this moment simply because I felt like this was a good climactic moment and I would wait until we talked about this to start doing anything more. Very much looking forward to uh, more stuff that's coming out since we're going to start switching up some writers here. I really enjoyed the Brian Reed stuff, so I'll be really curious to see other writers uh, being brought on here. So yeah, this has been the Slam Bang Exciting Festo-Rama New Ways to Die. Ending out Section 1, I guess, of Book 1 of Brand New Day. Thank you for listening to Spider-Man Dissemble. This is Jason Freston. This is Michael T. Bradley. Thank you very much.